Sometimes it seems as though I've waited my entire life to be photographed by Terry Richardson. With Terry, the relationship extends beyond the photograph. And if you're lucky, he will teach you something truly profound about yourself. I have discovered through him that shame is an obsolete notion and apology is an injustice to any performance. Perhaps it is his kind eyes behind those famous glasses or these famous glasses, the ones I'm wearing right there. Or maybe it's the giggling noise he makes at 4.30 in the morning when he's caught me in bed. Click, <laughs> click, 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 beautiful. To say he is a free spirit is a tremendous understatement and to say that he or I make people uncomfortable is spot on. That is the number of public allegations against Terry Richardson. Whether it be denouncing him, regretting working with him, or full on SA, these accounts are detailed, graphic, and disturbing. This is the photographer from hell. The following information in this video is included to provide context, not humanize or justify the allegations against Terry Richardson. <laughs> Nothing about Terry's childhood was normal. Terry is the son of Norma Kessler, who was an actress in New York City, and Bob Richardson, who was an up-and-coming fashion photographer. Terry's father was a walking paradox. He struggled with schizophrenia and had a life-crippling drug addiction. He thought of himself as an artistic genius, but was convinced that nobody could see his vision. He hated everything to do with photography, including the magazines and people he worked with. In the middle of his career, one of Bob's models introduced him to Max Jacobson, also known as Dr. Feelgood, a New York physician who provided amphetamine-laced vitamin injections to American elites one of which was John F. Kennedy. Bob Richardson became highly addicted to these injections and would go on drug-fueled benders, which was the only thing that could get him to do photography. In 1965, Terry was born, but it was not a pretty picture. His parents would move to Paris briefly, then back to New York City, and ultimately became swingers. Terry's father began to sleep with the models that he would work with, and he was quoted saying, often a session would wind up with sex. Terry's mom went after Bob's assistant. After multiple attempts to take his own life, 42-year-old Bob Richardson started dating 18-year-old Angelica Houston, who you may recognize from the Adams family. Norma moved on to musician lovers, including Jimi Hendrix and Chris Christopherson, but would ultimately marry Jackie Lomax within a year of knowing each other. Terry was caught in the middle of his parents' escapades, splitting his time between Woodstock with his mother and London with his father and Houston. According to Terry, he was ignored, neglected, and traumatized. In the 70s, Terry moved to California, England, back to Woodstock, and then Hollywood one last time. As Terry grew older, his father was running out of money, but he had a last resort Hollywood dream of making it. This was short-lived, and he became homeless. And around the same time, Terry's mother was critically injured in a car crash. After a long recovery, in 1982, Terry was given a camera by his mother and began to document his life in a rock band. In 1992, he decided to give up on music and start fresh in New York City. Unfortunately, this is where he got his big break. In order to understand why Terry Richardson was so successful as a photographer, we have to understand how he actually took pictures. Terry is known for popularizing the hard light snapshot aesthetic in photography. His signature style is shooting subjects against a white wall, with the flash of the camera mounted as close to the lens as possible. This is known as direct flash. Your typical photographer might use a professional large film format camera worth thousands of dollars. Terry Richardson is not your typical fashion photographer. There's people at home that have better cameras than I do, you know. When he first starts shooting, I'm just like, that's what he's working with, that's what he always uses. Even Diane said to me at one point, is, is this gonna be okay? Will we be able to see the bathing suits? <laughs> and he says, that's my best kept secret. This is what I shoot with. I mean, I used to just use like, you know, regular, you know, focused cameras and my eyes were really bad and I could, had a really hard time focusing cameras. So I bought a snapshot camera and I, I just started taking pictures with it. Found that the quality was just as good and they were just so much easier and more free to use. I have to 
have so much trust in him that he has an amazing eye that he's just not going to find this picture that my mom would take. You know? Contrary to setting up multiple light sources, soft boxes, and crafting a scene, point and shoot with direct flash appears lazy and gives off the vibe that anyone can do it. Benefits of this style include it's cheap, easy to produce, and requires little to no post-processing. It's also seen as edgy or cool because it's based in realism. When done right, direct flash photography is hyper-human because consumers can relate to the image. Although it appears easy to do, it's difficult to perfect because of how unforgiving the light source is. This means that the subject and the motion of the scene have to be just right to get a quality picture. However, in today's photography world, it's sometimes looked at as overdone, tacky, and annoying. Probably because Terry Richardson adopted it as his own unique style and ran with it. In 1994, Terry Richardson's work appeared in Vibe magazine, and it began to catch the attention of other large fashion companies. Throughout the 90s, Terry would work with world-renowned brands such as YSL, Gucci, Levi's, H&M, Tommy Hilfiger, Marc Jacobs, Diesel, Supreme, Aldo, Sisley, Rolling Stone, Vibe, GQ, Vogue, ID, Vice, Vanity Fair, and Harper's Bazaar. Terry's first photography show debuted in 1998 at Alleged Gallery. Titled These Colors Don't Run, featuring a 4x6 portrait of Terry Richardson's face with, let's just say, milk all over his face. And a 12x30 photo of a toothbrush inserted in some cheeks. Yeah. This is the pinnacle of high art. He would go on to have his art featured in various other galleries, but in my opinion, nothing was really groundbreaking. He just blended pornography with portrait photography, and that was shocking enough for the world to give him a platform. The nude pictures he took can easily be interpreted as misogynistic, demeaning, and disgusting. Part of Terry Richardson's appeal in the fashion world was his seemingly endless list of celebrity and brand connections. That network alone was enough to get people to want to work with him, which, if you ask me, is a problem in and of itself. When you have a photographer who vows to put you in vogue and agencies that back him up, it's easy to see how young girls could have been manipulated by Terry. And yes, manipulated, but we'll get to that. At the height of his career, his day rate was an astounding $160,000. And he was rumored to have made $58 million from 2012 to 2013 alone. Apparently, this was because of his collaborative book with Lady Gaga. Terry lived for the idea that he was a provocateur. His work was shocking for the sake of being shocking. It was not revolutionary, and it was a prime example of a sick man abusing his power to play out his twisted fantasies. Maybe I could get behind it if there weren't literally over 19 public allegations against him. In one interview, he was quoted saying, I was a shy kid, and now I'm this powerful guy with a boner, dominating all these girls. Terry Richardson is a self-proclaimed proud pervert, and he's also rumored to have created the selfie. This was because he would oftentimes appear in his own pictures along with high-profile celebrities. He would go one step further by asking his models to refer to him as Uncle Terry and acting as a literal character of himself by swapping wardrobes with his subjects. The iconic pedophile glasses and creepy uncle clothing has never been so terrifying. Terry Richardson was self-aware about his perversion, as you can see in this picture where Miley Cyrus is wearing a shirt that says, I was touched by Terry. And, unfortunately, Emily Ratajkowski wearing stickers on her chest with Terry's face on them. <laughs> I get the heebie-jeebies every time I look at Terry Richardson. Between the glasses, the flannels, the mutton chops, and the widow's peak. I mean, at least you can prevent that with the help of today's video sponsor, Keeps. Keeps is a subscription service that helps men keep their hair. They offer clinically proven treatments to help combat the symptoms of hair loss delivered right to your doorstep. Keeps treatment plans are affordable, typically half the cost of pharmacy prices. And all of their treatment plans are personalized and doctor recommended. Most Keeps customers notice results in just six months of starting treatment. When you sign up with Keeps, you are receiving 24 seven expert support because each treatment plan comes with one year of unlimited doctor messaging. Two out of three guys experience hair loss by the age of 35. Keeps offers clinically proven research backed treatments to stop hair loss and improve hair growth. Keeps offers a routine that works for you. In addition to clinically proven treatments, Keeps has an award-winning all-natural thickening shampoo and conditioner system. Keeps physicians will help you pick the best possible products for your specific condition and hair goals. 
Keeps is everything your hair needs delivered straight to your door. You can easily subscribe to Keeps and get refill reminders so you'll never run low on the products that you need to take care of your hair. Hair loss stops with Keeps. To get 50% off your first order, go to keeps.com slash filion or click on the link down below. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash filion. And thank you to Keeps for sponsoring this video. According to this article from Marie Claire, model Jamie Peck in 2010 alleges that Richardson suggested to make tea out of her used tampon and encouraged her to take photos of Richardson while assistants photograph them. This ultimately led to sexual acts taking place. In 2002, Terry Richardson told Vice that the goal of his upcoming campaign with Supreme was to put together a calendar that you could jerk off to. He said the shoot got a bit out of hand by the end. The women producing the shoot got freaked out and had to leave. I think every person there someone. It was intense. According to numerous accounts, Terry would get naked in front of his models in order to convince them to shoot nude. In 2005, Gabriella Johansson stated that Richardson disguised model consent forms as sign-in papers for a topless shoot. Richardson then pushed aggressively for Johansson to get fully nude, and she felt extremely uncomfortable. Foot touching? Oh no, you don't have to read it, just... Oh, okay. But foot touching are like... Super common. You can sign, you can skip all that. Oh, okay. Signed, all right, let's get started. <sighs> okay, so uh, go ahead and uh, let's, let's pose right here on this. The go ahead and grip that and rip it. Stripper pole? You haven't seen people, it's for exercise now? It's a thing, come on, come on. Naked, exercising naked? It's progressive, it's about female freedom. Uh, well, I we didn't talk about that before, so. I mean, you should have read the contract. Okay, baby. You comfortable with nudity yet? No. In the same year, a 17-year-old male model was booked for a test shoot that he didn't know would involve nudity, and Terry Richardson published his pictures three times in one of his books. He later sued Terry for invasion of privacy, intentional infliction of emotional distress, and negligence. Even stranger, this individual would go on to date Lady Gaga, who was one of Terry Richardson's biggest collaborators. In a 2000 interview with Hint Fashion Magazine, Terry stated, like a always said, it's not who you know, it's who you blow. I don't have a hole in my jeans for nothing. It was Jamie Peck's voice in March of 2010 that gave other victims the strength to come forward with their stories. This meant for nearly two decades, Terry Richardson got away with plastering his art all over Manhattan galleries. It was a sleazeballs fantasy that played out in real time. One constant among many of the stories was an alleged assistant by the name of Leslie Lesson, who was a high profile fashion stylist. According to the victims, she stood idly by encouraged and acted as damage control for the girls after Terry had his way with them. My name's Leslie Lesson and my ism is Chisel. There you have it. Okay. <laughs> That's another daily ism with Paula Miranda. And uh, you heard it from a very shy cat. Thanks. This would mean that she enabled and facilitated Terry Richardson to play out his perversions. Terry would go on to publish numerous photo books throughout his career. Terry Wood is a laughably bad assortment of pictures that best represent the glitz and glamour of Hollywood. I swear a toddler with a flip phone can take more thought-provoking images than Terry did in Terry Wood. I don't know who greenlit this project. It was apparent that this book was sold solely because of his perceived fame. However, there are two Terry Richardson books in particular that paint a better picture of how creepy Terry Richardson actually is. They were published to fuel Richardson's ego, and that's about it. Kibosh is a full-on pornographic book featuring Terry and his subjects engaging in various sexual acts. There's really nothing more to it. Number two, Terry World. Jeffrey Deitch, a New York gallerist, put on a show of Terry Richardson's hardcore work in 2004. Women who worked for the gallery objected to this and were offered one month paid leave by Jeffrey himself. 3,000 people attended, but only one picture was sold. Huh, maybe it has something to do with a literal predator's wiener being present in almost every single picture. It was a complete failure. However, the book publisher Tashin would scoop it up three weeks later and publish a book titled 
Terry world. And right now, it's near impossible to find these books for under a couple hundred to thousands of dollars. Not that you would want to. So what is Terry world, you might ask? Sex? What else? Why have my pants got a hole in the front? Welcome to Terry World. Who took the 1970s porn aesthetic and made it into fashion chic? Terry Richardson. Who made the trailer park trendy and the tractor hat de rigor? I'm sorry, excuse my French. Richardson again. Who's equally at home in Vogue, Harper's Bazaar, Purple, and Vice? Our boy Terry. Who uses his fashion money to fund an X-rated website? Yes. Richardson. And who can't resist getting his clothes off and jumping in front of his own lens? Well, that would be Terry Richardson as well. Porn stars, supermodels, transsexuals, hillbillies, friends, pets, and celebrities all do for his lens what they'll do for no other. And if anyone wonders why they did it, just blame it on Terry World, where taboos are null and void and fashion finds sex a perfect fit. This edition's special panic cover is reversible to a realistic looking academic book to keep the real contents hidden from your annoying boss or even help you impress an attractive onlooker. Nine people featured in Terry World wanted to sue him. Two of them actually did. In the early 2010s, he would go on to direct various music videos, including Beyonce's XO and Miley Cyrus's Unforgettable Wrecking Ball, which won Best Video at the 2014 VMAs. A book titled Focus, The Sexy, Secret, Sometimes Sordid World of Fashion Photographers by Michael Gross swiftly changed Miley Cyrus's mind on Terry Richardson. She later regretted working with him. However, the most unsettling cameo for me is his appearance in 30 Seconds to Mars' Hurricane music video. If you know anything about this music video, it was banned from MTV until another version was released because it's a straight BDSM erotic film. It was directed by Bartholomew Cubbins, which is a Jared Leto pseudonym or fake name, taken from Dr. Seuss's character. The Jared Leto and Terry Richardson connection is deep and raises a lot of questions. Two of the most openly problematic figures in Hollywood that no one can touch are best friends. Not just acquaintances, best friends. In 2017, a leaked email sent internally by James Woolhouse, CEO of Condé Nast International, cut all ties with Terry Richardson as a result of his sexual predation. He stated, any shoots that have been commissioned or any shoots that have been completed but not yet published should be killed and substituted with other material. The Condé Nast umbrella includes Vogue, Glamour, Wired, Vanity Fair, and GQ. Various other brands have followed in their footsteps and also cut ties with Richardson as well. Now he lives out his life in Woodstock, New York as a father of twins with wife Alex Bartolo, who was one of his assistants. Go figure. Terry Richardson currently walks around like a forgotten ghoul, blacklisted from every large publication and agency for good reason. All that's left are those godforsaken ugly pictures that marks the signature 2000s creepy uncle aesthetic. Every celebrity photo with Terry Richardson in it, or that dumb white background, gives me the exact same bone-chilling reaction that I get when I see pictures like these.